Hi, good afternoon. I'm pleased to declare the 2019 commencement for the Quinnipiac University Frank H. Netter, MD, School of Medicine officially open. Would everyone please stand for the national anthem, which will be performed by Talis Swisher, class of 2019. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet Please be seated. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the members of our platform party, which consists of our speaker, whom you meet in a few moments, university administrators, deans, and representatives of the university and the School of Medicine. It's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Judy Olian, president of Quinnipiac University. I'm delighted to be here with everyone today to celebrate this unforgettable milestone in each of our graduates' lives. This commencement marks an exciting and perhaps slightly anxious time for you, our graduates. For the past four years, Quinnipiac has been your home. Please know it will always be your home, and we hope you come back often. We are your constant, yes, in addition to your families, in this momentous time of change for you. Graduates, you are now doctors. Savor the moment. Yeah. This remarkable accomplishment and the journey that brought you here is frankly awesome. But before I heap all of the praise on you, the graduates, let us all also acknowledge those who are with you for your entire journey, spouses, partners, seagulls, that's significant others for those who don't know, parents, faculty, dear friends, who helped you every step of the way. Let us congratulate them too with gratitude for all they did to make this day possible. Now, graduates, you've sh shared in a very special time of learning and growth while here at Quinnipiac because of all this university and this school have to offer. But the truth is that your experience was transformational because of what each of you contributed and made of your experience here. It's you. You have been a trailblazing class in this young school's history, and you have left an indelible mark that will benefit future generations of medical students. You're entering a profession that desperately needs your expertise and your compassion. Due in large part to our aging population, healthcare needs are escalating and the United States 
could see a huge shortage of a, up to 120,000 physicians by 2030. And some of these shortages are already severe in parts of the country and in some marginalized communities that are medically underserved where healthcare is unaffordable to many and where chronic disease is rampant and untreated. You're already doing your part. Your caring and dedication have extended to local and global communities. You've volunteered at local clinics. You've teamed up with the law school to raise awareness of human trafficking and to stem the crisis. You've taken part in Science Fridays at schools in New Haven where you led science experiments. You've served the medically underserved communities of the greater Bridgeport area through the Bobcat Community Health Alliance, which is a student-run medical organization. You've raised awareness ab about rare diseases by organizing a program to encourage researchers to address the needs of those afflict afflicted with orphan diseases. You've participated in NEDRA's Health Careers Pathways to increase underrepresented students entering the health professions through this program. You've increased the reading engagement of local third graders and introduced basic concepts of neuroscience to middle schoolers. And you've raised hundreds, of, you've raised thousands of dollars for No Kid Hungry. You've raised funds to benefit integrated refugee and immigrant services. You've held monthly drives to collect diapers, non-perishable foods, and supplies for Iris. And I could go on and on and on. And you've done all of that while managing a very hefty course and workload. We are incredibly proud of you and admiring of your choices and passions. Of course, this also aligns with Quinnipiac's strategic priority of nurturing communities, which is one of the four pillars of our new strategic plan. You are each ambitious, talented, caring, and curious. And most importantly, you conduct yourselves with integrity and with decency. I expect that as you look back over these last four years, you marvel at the breadth of the experiences you've had, collaborating with interdisciplinary teams on holistic patient health, experimenting with cutting edge technologies and devices, participating in clinical and research initiatives alongside superbly talented and expert faculty, and making friends for life with some of the best people you'll ever meet. As you go forth as a Quinnipiac alum or alumnae, I encourage you to help others as you have been helped along the way, whether mentoring future generations of physicians who follow you, assisting neighbors in the community, children who are not benefiting from the childhood or education they deserve, or patients who seek your compassion. I also encourage you to remain curious and open to the new, to continue learning and growing. In our rapidly changing world, we don't know what we'll need to know in 10 years and maybe even in five years. What we do know is that to be successful and enlightened, we must be lifelong learners. As a QU graduate, beyond your sophisticated medical knowledge, we've positioned you with a mindset of continuing learning, curiosity, questioning, and critical thinking. That's the best preparation we could provide you with for 21st century careers and for the accelerated changes of this complex, globally connected world. Your class has also demonstrated an appreciation of differences, learning from, working with, and listening to people from different backgrounds is where the best ideas and solutions are generated. You are lucky and you are gifted. And as John F. Kennedy said, to those who much is given, much is expected. Remember to share your blessings and to give back. We will be forever proud of you and follow your life's journey with great interest. Please remain a bobcat for life Stay connected wherever you land. Find ways to remain in touch with your fellow QU family and engage in lifelong growth and learning also through QU. So congratulations, class of 2019. 
you have already made your mark and we can't wait to see how you continue to change the world. Thank you. It's now my privilege to turn the program over to Dr. Bruce Keppen, Dean of the School of Medicine. Thank you, Provost Thompson. Before I begin with my brief remarks, I would first like to welcome President Olian to her first School of Medicine commencement ceremony. As I understand, this is also her first Quinnipiac University commencement ceremony as our president, so I really hope this goes smoothly. <laughs> no pressure. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Provost Mark Thompson for his many years of support of the School of Medicine and especially of me as its dean. This is his last School of Medicine commencement ceremony because on June 1, he assumes the position of president of Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston. Mark, the entire School of Medicine community wishes you all the best in your new position. On behalf of the School of Medicine, I would like to welcome the members of the class of 2019, their families and friends, our many special guests, and representatives from our clinical partners. I would also like to acknowledge the faculty and staff who are here and who have done so much to get us to this very special day. To the family and friends of the class of 2019, you have much to be proud of today. Your graduate is special to you and they are all certainly special to us. Thank you for sharing them with us for these past four years. I trust that in your eyes, we have treated them well. If you have been financially supporting your graduate, I am pleased to say those days are now over. Starting next month, they actually start to earn a salary. Dear members of the class of 2019, it seems like only yesterday that we were in this arena for your white coat ceremony. It has truly been an amazing four years, and for me, they have literally flown by. I know you took a chance coming to a new medical school. When you joined us back in August of 2015, you had to trust that this new school would prepare you to succeed on the USMLE licensing exams, and that we would help you match into that all-important residency program so that you could complete your training, and become the physician you aspired to be. We, the faculty and staff of the School of Medicine, are certainly happy that you were willing to entrust us with your education. It is my hope that when you reflect back on your time with us, you too will be happy with the decision you made four years ago. During your time with us, you have grown in so many ways. You have learned a new language, the language of medicine. You have acquired the skills necessary to listen to and help people who are suffering, who are vulnerable, who are also fearful. You have also found time to volunteer in the community. Most importantly, you have laid the foundation of your professional identity. I want to remind you of what I told you about the development of your professional identity during your white coat ceremony. See if you remember. And I'm quoting from my remarks back four years ago. The formation of your professional identity doesn't just happen. It takes your full engagement in work. Some of this will be easy, but some of this will be very hard. Your faculty will help you, but they cannot form your professional identity. That requires your effort. Effort that includes finding and working with mentors and constant self-reflection. Your professional identity will not be fully formed when you graduate from medical school. You will continue to shape it during your residency training and during your entire career. I wish you all the best in that continued formation of your professional identity. I hope you appreciate what you have accomplished and how you have grown personally and professionally over the past four years. While I will allow the faculty and staff to take some credit for your growth and development, as well as some of your many successes, the truth is that you did it. So be very proud of who you are and what you have become. 
As you leave us, I know that I speak on behalf of all the faculty and staff. Please know that we wish you only the very best in your careers. I know you will make us proud because you already have done so. Thank you for choosing us as your medical school. You are and always will be a member of the Netter family. You are always welcome here, so please come back and come back often. Always stay in touch, and congratulations and best wishes. I would now ask Dr. Huram Guman, Associate Professor of Family Medicine and Director of the school's primary care clerkship to come forward to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Pamela Weibel is a family physician who has made, who has made it her mission to help fellow physicians avoid burnout and live happier and healthier lives. She believes that assembly line medicine is one of the biggest threats to patient relationships. She encourages doctors to consider creating community clinics to deliver the kind of healthcare they envision in medical school. Noting that overwork and sleep deprivation can create a lethal combination. The author and motivational speaker also wants to keep doctors from dying by suicide, an epidemic that she says no one talks about. She travels the country lecturing on this topic and runs a doctor suicide hotline. She has helped countless medical students and physicians heal from anxiety, depression, and PTSD. It is now my privilege to introduce our commencement speaker, Dr. Pamela Weibel. In less than 30 minutes, you will all finally be physicians. And this summer, you'll be set loose on your very own patients. How exciting is that? Maybe a little nerve-wracking. During your career, depending on specialty and work ethic, you may care for more than 100,000 patients. Only a few will live in your heart forever. You will join them on a sacred journey for two. Trust them, they will guide you from nervous new doctor and teach you how to be a healer. As a new intern, I was assigned to Emily. She had idiopathic bronchiectasis, a fatal lung disease, and refused to take her meds, so the transplant team signed off on her case. They abandoned us. We were both 25. Sobbing uncontrollably, with her oximeter alarm shrilling, she looked to me for help. I didn't know how to help her die. So I snuck my dog Happy into her room at night for midnight excursions. With her portable oxygen tank rolling behind us, we'd hold hands and disappear across the hospital parking lot into a blanket of grass where we'd gaze at the stars and she'd share her grief of never giving birth or finding her soulmate. Emily and I became soul sisters on an adventure of a lifetime until the day in her bedroom, sitting beside her body wrapped in a Mickey Mouse blanket, I signed her over to the morgue. Emily has never left my side. Patients like Emily will hold your hand and lead you to places where there is no algorithm, no attending, where you have no earthly idea what you're doing. All you have is each other. After Emily, Harold stumbled awkwardly into my heart, a loner who distrusted technology and doctors. He lived in the woods caretaking a wildlife refuge with no electricity, no phone or car, but he had great health insurance through his employer. 
his ex-girlfriend recommended me. So he'd hitchhike to my office three hours each way. One day he came in, his back covered in nodules. I excised one, sewed him up, gave him a kiss on the forehead, a slip for a chest x-ray, and an appointment to return next week. It was metastatic lung cancer. He chose chemo, moved to the city, got a cell phone, and quickly spiraled to his death. I got him back to his cabin. He died the next day. His ashes now food for the forest he so loved, where I visit him each fall. I think Emily kind of helped me with Harold. You're never really alone. Some patients follow you forever. It's weird that I only remember one patient from med school, Veronica, end-stage kidney disease. I still see her alone in her crib in that dark hospital room, where I'd lift her up and sing her to sleep in a rocking chair. My peds attending walked by one day, and I remember this probably because it landed in my permanent record, <laughs> and he said, Dr. Weibel, you are a doctor when your patients need a doctor, and a mother when they need a mother. I'm proof that you don't need to maintain professional distance. I believe in professional closeness. You can be a doctor and be the real you. Is it legal to kiss dying patients? I don't care. I do what's right for patients. You will stray from evidence-based guidelines and do the same. Because what patients truly need has no ICD or CPT codes and never requires a prior authorization. As an intern, do something so epic it can't fit into an EMR. Our biggest threat to patient relationships is what I call assembly line medicine. I'm a womb to tomb till death do us part physician. My dream of being a small town family doctor doing house calls was way too big for my little cubicle. If your dream is bigger than your cubicle, leave your cubicle. You can practice medicine your way as an employee, a business owner, or an entrepreneur. And if you're freaking out about your debt or end up hating your residency, don't despair. You can launch your own clinic with just one or two years of postgraduate training. And if you register it as a nonprofit, you can totally get your loans forgiven. <laughs> Doctors I know are doing this now. As a physician employee in a big box clinic, I was so miserable, even suicidal. Then I did something really crazy which, what would that be for me? I asked my patients for help. I invited them to design their own ideal medical clinic to write my job description for me. And I promised to do whatever they wanted as long as it was basically legal. They shared 100 pages of their most creative ideas. We adopted 90% of their feedback and opened our community clinic one month later without any outside funding, where I've never turned any patient away for the last 14 years for lack of money. And this is the first ideal clinic designed entirely by patients. My patients saved my career and my life, because I was thinking of working at Starbucks and just doing something totally different. But I probably wouldn't have gotten the job because they'd be like, you're overqualified. So luckily, my patients came to my rescue. And I want to assure you that your relationships with patients will save you from lawsuits, because patients don't sue doctors they love. I've been running a physician suicide hotline since surviving my own close call. Several docs told me that their suicides were actually averted by a patient thank you card. Keep your thank you cards. Read them often. On your worst night, those letters may save your life. 
After speaking to thousands of suicidal physicians who survived, I noticed one trait they share very unusual among doctors. They ask for help. The most common phrase I hear, I would have been one of your statistics, but you called me back right away. They're shocked that I called them back. I ask, when you're on call, don't you respond right away? Hmm, why don't we do that for each other? In your last few minutes as a medical student, take a good look at the person to your right and left. Good. <laughs> Hold hands for a minute, please. Aw, it's so cute. <laughs> I'm asking you to please be on call for each other. Look, listen, and feel. Notice when a doctor is struggling. Look up at all your beautiful uh, parents celebrating you today. They're so proud. Promise to watch over each other so no parent ever gets a phone call from the police that their child has died in residency. I was tasked with delivering a few uplifting words today, and they're coming. For now, though, you might want to keep holding hands just a little longer. You can do it. This is tough to hear, but so important for your future. A med student in the Army Reserves told me she was less stressed in Afghanistan during active sniper fire than med school. Here's why. That was like totally shocking. I had to call her and figure out like, what? The reason why is she had total trust in her comrades. She knew if killed by enemy fire, she would be brought home, covered in American flag, and honored with a proper burial. They had her back. In med school, she never knew who would stab her in the back. Trying to change that culture here, starting with your generation, okay? You can do it. We are brothers and sisters in medicine. Please protect and defend each other. If a resident is being pimped with esoteric questions, say, I don't think any of us know the answer. Let's look it up together. Please do that. And when in doubt, hold hands. Be like the preschoolers on the wooded path by my house. Every morning they walk by. They're so cute. Almost makes me want to have kids, but not really. Um, <laughs> it's much easier to like have you as my kids. You're already diaper trained and everything. You're already, you already know how to go to the bathroom and you're, you already know how to take a shower and you can tie your own shoes. You know, I've just never really been into the young kid thing looks really difficult. Anyway, but it's really cute to watch them. Uh, they're preschoolers that are getting, I don't know if you've heard of this, rope trained. Um, there's a rope that they hold on to and they each put one hand on the rope so that they learn how to walk in a line and they're equally spaced. And they're the cutest thing in Oregon because they all have like colorful little tiny rain jackets, all different colors, right? And little tiny rain boots and they all like march down this little wooded path in front of my house, they're so cute. So it's the most adorable scene ever, and what, what happens is see if one of them stops to look at a little mushroom, right? They all stop with the rope, and they all look at it. So see, that's what we should still be doing, right? I mean, yeah, it, it just stick together, hold hands, because, you know, I've, I've taken hundreds of doctors into the woods on hot springs retreats, soaking together in the bubbling lithium-infused water under the stars in the Oregon forest where Harold, Harold once lived. So I take them out to where Harold's ashes are, right? And these hot springs are on a cliff overlooking the Brighton Bush ri River. It's like so amazing. And it's kind of wild when I wrote this. I was thinking how interesting that Harold's kind of helping me heal doctors now. But the weird thing that happens every once in a while in these retreats, a doctor will come up to me and say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't even like doctors. I think that was Harold's opening line during our first office visit. But it took me years to deconstruct that comment from a physician. 
Why do doctors dislike doctors? Hurt people hurt people. Wounded healers wound each other. Most people don't bond over codes, crash carts, and stillborns. Bonding over trauma creates trauma bonds, leading to maladaptive drug and alcohol use to numb the pain. So the solution here is to befriend each other by doing stuff normal people do every once in a while, right? Instead of bonding over dead bodies and, you know, so many suffering patients, go on a hike and cook dinner together. And as interns, the best way to prevent trauma bonds is to first bond over your hopes and dreams with your new colleagues. Now to celebrate. My number one recommendation, always keep your umbilical cord plugged into your dream. Reflect back on medical school. Remember how you felt on your favorite rotation or with that attending who really inspired you to go for your dreams. Maybe you have a patient like Emily or Harold or Veronica who touched your heart. I want you to go back to those precious moments. Hopefully you can all remember one of those precious moments, your favorite rotation. And I want you to ask yourself these three questions back in the moments. So do you ever feel so excited that you can't wait to get to work Monday morning to see that special patient again? Have you ever felt that way through all of medical school, right? Number two, are you having so much fun at work that you would do it for free? Like delivering this amazing baby and, you know, these, these incredible experiences that you have. I mean, I think all the time in my office, wow, this is so much fun. I don't even need to get paid. This is amazing. And, and number three, do you love your job so much that you never want to retire? Like you can't imagine just sitting on a golf course like all day long. It wouldn't be as fun. So raise your hand if you answered yes to any one of those questions. Oh, good. Your dreams are still alive. You kept many of their dreams alive. Congratulations. What a good crew of teachers. So those of you who raised your hands, which it seemed like it was the majority, some of you were a little worried and were halfway putting your hand up, but I want you to realize that you are very fortunate to still have passion for your career, which you should have when you graduate medical school. I asked those same three questions to 4,000 doctors during a keynote in Las Vegas. And everyone was laughing to hide the pain of losing their dreams. I can still answer yes to all three questions. And so could about 20 doctors out of 4,000. May you be one of those 20 doctors to create such an amazing life in medicine that you'll never need a vacation. Inspired by a Zen poet, I'll conclude with this. Physicians who are masters in the art of medicine make little distinction between their work and their play, their labor and their leisure, their mind and their body, their education and their recreation, their love and their religion. They hardly know which is which and simply pursue whatever they do with excellence and grace, leaving others to decide whether they are working or playing. To them, they are always doing both. May you be blessed on your journey Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Weibel. I would now ask William Paulson, the director of our anesthesiologist assistant program, to come forward to present the anesthesiologist assistant candidates for the degree of Masters of Medical Science. Thank you, Dr. Kepin. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Medical Science please approach the stage?
Kyle Stephen Brunner. Brienne Nicole Siegford. <laughs> Madam President, I have the honor to present from the Frank H. Netter, MD, School of Medicine, candidates for the degree of Master of Medical Science and Anesthesiologist Assistant. Thank you, Dr. Paulson. Um, by the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Master of Medical Science Anesthesiologist Assistant with all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations. I would now ask Dr. Kim Pham, the school's Dean of Students, to come forward to introduce the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Drs. Miklos Fogarasi, Listy Thomas, and Rebecca Zucconi, please come forward to perform the hooding. Srijan Adhikari. <laughs> Aziz Obayomi Akinlolu. Derek George Armstrong. <laughs> Natasha Bavar. <laughs> Nicole Valentina Bahrami. Nicole is the recipient of the award for excellent performance in a required clinical clerkship, emergency medicine. Dennis Andrezovich Barban. Colin Daniel Beals Reed. Artie Buchan. Rachel King Blewett. <laughs> Joshua Fonseca Bolaños. <laughs> Yuri Brito. <laughs> Douglas Campbell. <laughs> Christopher Michael Caracciolo. Jeremy Carroll. <laughs> Daniel Andres Castellin. <laughs> Rishi Chada. <laughs> Sarah Ling Yin Chu. Molly Catherine Clark. Molly is the recipient of the Award for Excellent Performance in a Required Clinical Clerkship, Pediatrics. Michael Dabrowski. Shana Schreiber Dalal. Shana will be hooded by her father, Dr. Rick Schintelan. <laughs> Joseph Devlin. <laughs> William Forrest Duzen. <laughs> Alexander Antonio Erbella. He'll be hooded by his father, Dr. Jose Arbello, Jr.
Scott Irwin. Corinne Joy Eugenio. Josh Benjamin Finlay. He will be hooded by his father, Dr. Finlay. Elliot C. Fox. Zachary Friedman. Marissa Goshorn. Isaiah Ho. Isaiah is the recipient of the award for excellent performance in a required clinical clerkship, family medicine. Norbert Hootsman. Evan Austin Jamie Fields. Jonathan Ronson Koppel. He'll be hooded by his father, Dr. James Koppel. Eric Chaoyang Ku. Derek R. Lejeune. Derek is the recipient of the Award for Excellent Performance in a Required Clinical Clerkship, Internal Medicine. Alexa Xiaoxiao Li. Kayla Marilyn McGrath. Angelo Malozzi. Angelo will be hooded by his father, Dr. Angelo Malozzi. And his sister, Christina Malozzi. There you are. Gregory Maltzberg. Paul James McCabe. Emily Suzanne Mills. <laughs> Mevish A. Mirza. She will be hooded by her mother and father, Drs. Farial and Atik Mirza. Paul Coogan Montana. <laughs> Miriam Nathan. Miriam will be hooded by her mom, Dr. Nadia Nathan. Miriam will receive, is the winner of the Dean's Leadership Award. Gregory N. Newman. Alvin Eng. Bianca Dilesh Patel. Roshni Patel. Shelja Himansu Patel. Shelja is the recipient of the Connecticut Academy, Academy of Family Physicians, Dr. David and Arthur Schumann Award. Zachary William Patinkin. Zachary is the recipient of the Connecticut chapter of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology Award. He has just been hooded by his mother, Dr. Sandra Friedman. Sean Michael Panetti. Andrew Curtis Peterson. Andy Pham. Aruna Prita 
Thank you. Alexander Philip Lachaki. Jerome E. Parmaraz. Christina Pratt. <laughs> Daniel J. Kazi. Mark V. Keelan. Gabrielle Leigh Ransford. Ashkin Rosmara. Ashkin is the recipient of two awards. The Award for Excellent Performance in a Required Clinical Clerkship, Surgery, and the Connecticut Chapter American College of Surgeons Award. Caitlin Rinkosiak. Joshua Rismani. Josh M. Rocky. Farah L. Saleh. Farah is the recipient of the award for excellent performance in a required clinical clerkship, obstetrics and gynecology. Enrico Michael Scarpelli. Palak Dwarkesh Shah. Palak is the recipient of the Connecticut Academy of Family Physicians Annual Student Award. Michael Allen Smith. Samuel Edward Sondheim. Devin Jeanette Soucier. Devin will be hooded by her father and mother, Dr. Donald Soucier and Dr. Deborah Fresnick. Eleanor Sorokin Stein. Eleanor is the recipient of the Gerald R. Berg, MD, Service Award. This award recognizes an individual who demonstrates selfless and compassionate service to the community. Zachary Isaac Steinman. Catherine Sudal. Catherine is the recipient of the Award for Excellent Performance in a Required Clinical Clerkship, Psychiatry. Calvin Sung. Dallas Michael Frimanis Swisher. He will be hooded by his mother, Dr. Rita Frimanis. Fahad Syed. Babak Tadian. Mark Christopher Tarsillo. Jared Donald Thomas. Jared is the recipient of the Connecticut Chapter American College of Physicians Recognition Award. Allison Braze Travers. Allison will be hooded by her sister, Dr. Emily Travers, and her mother, Dr. Nancy Braze. Justin Van Herbeek. <laughs> Hubert Wang. <laughs> Hubert will be hooded by his father, Dr. Jin Wang. <laughs> Richard Gahoy Wang. 
Jun Tu Zen, and John Edward Franklin Tan Zobian. Will the candidates please rise? Madam President, I have the honor to present from the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Medicine with all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations. This is the time to throw the hat. And just remember to return a hat to the rental. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Bona, Professor of Medical Sciences and Medicine, to deliver remarks on behalf of the faculty of the School of Medicine. President Olian, Provost Thompson, Dean Keppen, Dr. Weibel, Netter faculty and administrators, class of 2019, your family and friends. Let me first say that I am honored and privileged to be representing the faculty of the School of Medicine and addressing you at this time of your graduation. Please accept my heartfelt thanks. Let me be also among the many who will congratulate you today. You have worked hard, probably played hard as well, and learned a whole bunch. But you are ready for your next phase of training. So congratulations on a job well done. Once upon a time, in the summer of 2015, a group of students arrived at the Netter School of Medicine, full of energy and ambition and eager to learn. And that's exactly what you've done. You've learned an incredible amount over the last four years. You have learned about normal human function. You have learned about a long litany of human disease. You've learned how to elicit information from a patient and care for that individual in the community or in the hospital. You have undoubtedly learned innumerable other things about the practice of medicine, the range of health inequities, medical economics, nuances of the electronic medical record, to name just a few. I'm sure you also learned from some remarkable physicians, mentors, health care providers, many acting as exemplary role models at our affiliated hospitals, your MESH and other ambulatory sites, and some of the medical universities and programs you've traveled to. I'm guessing you've also learned a bit more about yourself during this journey. For instance, some of you from California or the Southwest might have been surprised to learn how much you like the winters up in Connecticut. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> you learned what field of medicine interested you more than others, 
you are learning how you feel about caring for the sick, the well, and the very sick. As you know, there'll be no shortage of opportunities to continue learning in your careers. The science in support of medical practice is providing us with information at an exponential pace, one that has been, at least for me, almost overwhelming to work in and think about. At the same time, the practice of medicine and the skills a physician needs to acquire in the modern day are changing rapidly as well. You will keep learning now by doing and practicing as well as by studying your profession. I would urge you to embrace that and let the passion of what you do drive your desire for learning. A quote from the poem Desiderata, which I keep posted above my desk, is well suited, I believe, for this occasion. Keep interested in your own career, however humble, it is a real possession in the changing fortune of time. Your careers in medicine will undoubtedly allow you to do many wonderful things with your lives. I'd also urge you to continue to learn about yourselves. Do that with the help and support of family and cherished friends. As we better understand ourselves, we are better able to serve our patients and to be present for ourselves, our families, and our friends. This will take time and energy. Both will be in short supply. Find the time and summon the energy for this, as I believe it will pay off handsomely. As you continue to learn, share that knowledge. Teach your patients about wellness and health and disease. Explain things in a way that they can understand. For as you know, understanding makes us all feel more comfortable and at ease with our lives. Teach your physician colleagues and be patient with them as their knowledge in the field of medicine you choose to study will not always be as great as yours. It may surprise you to hear this, but in 10 years, not all of you will remember the complete differential diagnosis of a low serum sodium, an elevated bilirubin, or for that matter, a low blood platelet count. <laughs> <laughs> had to say it. <laughs> and teach and learn from other healthcare providers. Many of them will have been at the profession for many years and have much to offer. They will also be anxious to gobble up new information about the medical and social sciences, so share and receive graciously. But at the end of the day, all this effort needs to be channeled at the care of the patient for that is what our calling is all about. Listening to the patient, understanding as best you can their perspective on their lives, health, wellness, and illness, and offering to help in the best way you can. A quote by President Theodore Roosevelt sums this up nicely. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So be sure to care and let people know you care. Best of luck to each and every one of you. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Dr. Miriam Nathan, class president, who will give remarks on behalf of the class of 2019. 2019. Hello, everyone. Um, as I stand here live, I know Dr. Pham is extremely nervous that I'm going <laughs> to improvise, but I have a script, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> except for that part. Uh, so today is a big day. You've traveled to be here. Uh, some of you from great distances, we have Aziz's family from Nigeria in the audience. We've got Daniel's parents from Ecuador. Srijan's parents from Nepal.
And his new baby is here, his n brand new newborn son, um, just a couple days ago. So congratulations, Srija. And even though today is a big day and a big moment, uh, most of our journey and most of life really has been kind of made up of small moments, moments where there are no cameras or ceremonies or celebrations. For our families, those small moments have been walking us to school, reading to us at night, picture day, back to school shopping, forced to buy yet another two and a half inch three ring binder, or helping our teenage minds navigate through pseudo catastrophes that somehow you knew would end up all right. So I wanna thank the people who are here today in the audience and importantly, the people who are uh, with us today in spirit for giving us all such wonderful small moments, the ones that allow for today to be as truly big as it is. So thank you very much. Now for us, those everyday moments have been getting food with a friend, studying together, movie nights, class dinners before exams, or Trevor's chili cook-offs. And I've learned something from you over the past four years of moments. I've learned from Zach Steinman, who, after a 12-hour night shift, sat with a woman in the ED who had just lost her husband, just listening to the story of how the two had met over 60 years ago. I've learned from Richard Wong, who, on the drive home from the hospital, turned around and drove back because he remembered he promised a patient he would listen to one more World War II story. I've learned from Kat Sudol, who was caring for a woman with severe psychosis, life-threatening delusions. She went to see this person every day for a month, and when the psychosis had lifted, the only thing she could remember was Kat, because in her delusions, Kat had actually been Wonder Woman, protecting her the entire time. So here's what I've learned exactly. These are moments that people will never see, they'll never hear about, but they may have meant the world to those patients. And there may come a time when you'll have five of those stories in a day and you'll go home to sleep like it was just a regular day because you know that you're not really Wonder Woman and you're not invincible. But at the end of a regular day, think about what a privilege it is for those to be our everyday small moments that will make full the rest of our lives. When the inaugural class of 2017 interviewed us, they were looking for people who would contribute who would build, who would not just preserve, but who would cultivate what they had started. Since then, we've been consistent in our commitment to our future patients, as well as our commitment to one another. And that's not easy, because through years of studying and exams and rotations and research, life has been going on the whole time, and not in the background. And when it's been tough, we've found strength in each other. So today, when you leave that place, when you leave this place, take that with you and share it. And on days when you are unable to empower yourself from within, may you find strength in your patient's resilience, recognizing that sometimes even to live may be an act of courage. May you speak with confidence and listen with humility. May you have the wisdom to admit uncertainty but the passion to learn. May you lead with integrity and act from empathy. And of course, may you continue to find joy in all the small moments. Class of 2019, it has been challenging, it has been fun, it's been humbling, and it's been a sincere honor to study medicine with you. Thank you and congratulations. Dr. Abayomi Akanji, Professor of Medical Sciences, will now lead the class in the Hippocratic Oath, the text of, text of which is printed in the uh, back of your program. 
I would also invite any physicians in attendance to stand and join the class in the oath. Let us all read the text together, starting now. I swear to fulfill to the best of my ability and judgment this covenant. I will respect the hard-won scientific gains of those physicians in whose steps I walk and gladly share such knowledge as is mine with those who are to follow. I will apply for the benefit of the sick all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science, and that warmth, sympathy, and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will not be ashamed to say I know none, nor will I fail to call in my colleagues when the skills of another are needed for a patient's recovery. I will respect the privacy of my patient, for their problems are not disclosed to me that the world may know. Most especially, must I tread with care in matters of life and death. If it is given me to save a life, all thanks, but it may also be within my power to take a life. This awesome responsibility must be faced with great humbleness and awareness of my own frailty. Above all, I must not play at God. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. My responsibility includes these related problems if I'm to care adequately for the sick. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to care. I will remember that I am a member of society with special obligations to all my fellow human beings, so that mind and body, as well as the infirm. If I do not violate this oath, may I enjoy life and art, respected while I live, and remembered with affection thereafter. May I always act so as to preserve the finest traditions of my calling. And may I long experience the joy of healing those who seek my help. Congratulations. It is now my pleasure to ask Dr. Christina Malazzi of the class of 2017 to come forward and deliver a welcome on behalf of the alumni. I promised my brother I wouldn't embarrass him, but I wanted to say Congratulations, uh, especially to Angelo, and I'm very proud of him, as I'm proud of all of you. Um, and I want to say that this is a great moment because you are officially doctors, but don't have the responsibility yet of residency. So I ask the graduates to please rise. It is my honor to stand before you as a member of the class of 2017. I invite you to move your tassel to the left of your cap. <laughs> this simple act signifies your transition from student to alumnus and the continuation of your unique, meaningful, and lifelong relationship with Quinnipiac. I'm especially pleased to have you all as fellow alumni. Congratulations. On behalf of President Olean and the Frank H. Netter MD School of Medicine, I again offer congratulations to the members of the class of 2019. 
As we conclude today's ceremony, I do have a few announcements. Only the platform party and faculty will recess out. We ask the graduates to go to the area behind the stage for a class photo. Families and guests, we ask that you give your graduate a few minutes to have their photo taken before you meet up with them. We ask that you either remain at your seats or go directly to the reception at the Rocky Top Student Center next door. Transportation to the Rocky Top Student Center for those needing assistance is available. Once outside, you will see signs on the left. Now please stand for the recessional. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 